So Matthew 25, 1 through 13, is a parable that many people wrongly assume is about saved and unsaved. But it's actually about all of those who know the gospel and profess Christ. It's actually about those in the church. The parable reads, this was Jesus telling a story. Um, it's called the parable of the wise and foolish. It calls, depending on the translation, virgins or bridesmaids. So it's, they're called depending on which translation. But it says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. Then all of those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Verse 13 says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so this parable is a reminder to be prepared for the unexpected second coming of Jesus Christ, which is not the same event as people discussing the rapture. These are two different events. The rapture, I don't have a lot of um, opinions on that, would happen previous to the second coming of Christ as it's believed. But I'm not, I'm not going to get into that because I, I don't know enough about it. But what happens after the second coming is that every single person is going to face eternal judgment, good judgment or bad. There's two judgments for those who were going to heaven and those who are not going to heaven. And according to Jesus in this parable, the foolish did not prepare themselves for the final judgment and they are going to find themselves shut out of heaven as a result. The ten virgins in the parable represent Christians, which most people don't realize. They were waiting for the return of Jesus Christ, who in this parable is the groom, and in Jewish weddings in the first century, they often look, they happen at the end of harvest time. It's a large gathering of people, lots of food, drink, music, dancing. Guests wore very special clothes to these events. The bride and her close friends would wait at her family home until the groom came to take her to the place that would be their new home. And no one but the groom's father knew the exact time that the groom would come. The bridesmaids, would have to plan ahead and be ready with their lamps for whenever he would finally come and they had no idea when and when the groom arrived at the bride's house he would ask to see her when she would come out he would lift her veil he would express great joy in being able to see her the whole wedding procession would move very excitedly through the streets of the and to the feast and the lamps most commonly used in this century were small about the size of a hand they were made from clay. They were shallow covered dishes with two holes in the top and olive oil was poured through the larger of the holes and a wick was placed in the smaller hole. The wick was carefully trimmed down because if it burned down too low, it would start to smoke and then the fire would go out. And the five prepared bridesmaids brought extra oil, which symbolizes grace. That's what it symbolizes in this parable from their committed relationship to the groom. And when the groom's arrival was later than expected, the prepared ladies, who were also tired and sleepy, but this shows that even at their low point, their grace still carried them through, 
and they would be rewarded in a great way at the wedding feast, or in our case, in eternity in heaven, just for being prepared at all times so that even when we're in a valley, we are still okay because the grace we have stored up is going to carry us through. The custom of the day was for the bridesmaids or virgins to have their lamps ready as they waited with the bride for the bridegroom to come and escort all of them to the wedding ceremony. Matthew 25, 5 says, But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And the fact that they were all sleeping does not mean that they had fallen away, but it can mean that a time will come when they cannot work, according to John 9, 4, on Matthew 25, 5 through 6, it says, And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming, go out to meet him. And then at that cry, all of the bridesmaids could hear the call, and they all awoke, and they needed their lamps at that moment. They prepared their lamps, but for them to burn brightly in the midnight hour, more oil was needed than what was already in their lamps. And it was then that the foolish five virgins realized that their lamps were going to go out. They knew they had neglected the most important task of the entire event. And they then tried to get oil from the ones who were prepared, but the wise didn't have enough for themselves and them. The foolish were then forced to go out into the cellars in the market. The sellers were the ones who would crush the olives for oil. They had to go out and get oil from them to put in their vessels. And today there are too many people of this type not ready at all for the second coming of Christ, but they're hiding amongst the Christians that are ready. People trust them because they attend church and they seem to be good people, but the time is coming when they are going to be shown for who they really are. And when the bridegroom came, it was too late to buy oil. And those who were ready went in with him. And according to Matthew 25, 11 through 12, afterwards the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered it and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Once the feast had begun, the groom's family closed and locked the gate, probably to keep out strangers and guests that weren't invited. And once the foolish bridesmaids arrived, they were not allowed in. And Jesus ends his parable by explaining its meaning, verse 13, that none of us know the hour when Jesus will come. We should be wise and we should always be ready. The lamps represent our confession of faith and they cannot shine without oil. And to obtain oil, something must be crushed. Lamps that brightly shine are because Someone is walking close in the footsteps of Jesus. But if a person is not doing that, and for example, 1 Peter 2, 21 to 23, it says, who when he was reviled did not revile in return. Let's say they are not walking close to Jesus and they still behave in that way where they revile in return, that lamp will not shine. But in order for someone to not revile in return, something within has to be crushed. Self-will, reputation, honor, something has to be crushed. But that lamp will shine. Galatians 5, 19 to 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication. Fornication is sex outside of marriage, any kind of sex outside of marriage. Uncleanness, lewdness idolatry, which is something you love or serve more than God, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you time in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God, meaning those who do these things as, a, as just free choices they can make are not going to heaven according to Jesus. And these are really obvious sins. Most of these things are something that people would look at you if you did them and say they're not a Christian. People judge it that way. 
So it isn't that God is being unreasonable. People who don't even know him will say if they're doing those things, they're not a Christian. So people who don't even honor God themselves and aren't even his, they're already deciding that you shouldn't go to heaven by the way you act. So it is a pretty much a universal thing in people to know that you will not please God nor be with him if you continue to live that way. And even the five foolish virgins would be the type that go about doing things they want the way that they want, but if confronted, they will deny that. They will say that they are not a sinner, they are not sinning, because the only important thing to them is is that their light, the lamps shine and if their lamps shine, because they have them with enough oil, people won't judge them. And they're totally satisfied with that because they don't care so much about the bridegroom's thoughts as much as they care about what do other people think of me. And they only want to look right because of the people that they want to impress. The wise virgins, however, thought about gathering oil in their vessels way before after hard days choosing to go and sit with Jesus in a quiet place, they would reflect on what they have done that did not honor their king. They would see themselves before their savior where they were safe to confess their sin and crush their sin. And there is no one when you're sitting at the feet of Jesus to impress, no one. There was no need for a lamp to shine or not shine. So this speaks to a life that the Bible calls hidden with Christ in God, where they went there with no agenda, but to make sure that he and them were good. The foolish virgins were simply satisfied when people don't judge them and that they look great to others. Outwardly, they're full of good works. They always feel compelled to be busy doing things that seem important with others that seem important, but they don't rest and get quiet before God that is not part of their list. They have to be doing something that is observable. The Bible references Martha of this same way that her zeal in serving was soulish. It was completely soulish, meaning she wasn't operating in a spiritual mindset. She was operating in what she needed. She couldn't understand Mary who was sitting at Jesus' feet because she was so busy serving and expecting people to notice people can only see our lamp they cannot see the vessel because it's hidden they cannot distinguish between who's good and who's bad who's wise and who's foolish although they can see that some of the lamps have less oil and they don't shine as brightly and to overcome those sins where the spirit gives you a deeper light in the hidden means that you're not doing your works to be seen, but because you love Jesus, that everything you do is for him, no other reason, that makes you wise if that is why, your why on how you serve. You will be taken by Jesus when he comes as a thief to fetch those who are ready. And it says this will happen during a time of peace. So it will be before everything gets crazy. That's why many people think we're in that window right now, that if you are where you are supposed to be with Jesus, this would be the time to make sure you had that right. And after we are taken with Jesus, we will be forever then with him, the Father, and the angels. This will, then we will go to the city of gold. There's some major lessons to be learned from this story. Sincere Christians are the wise virgins and foolish ones are hypocrites. Hypocrites profess their love of God and show many outward signs of being faithful to Christ, but the truth is very different on the inside. We can fool each other all day long. We can even fool ourselves at times. But God is never fooled. God knows exactly what we're up to. He knows our thoughts before. He knows everything. He knows exactly what we're doing. He sees how cold our heart is. He sees our bitterness. He sees how hollow we are. He sees how much we hate reading the Bible. He sees how much we actually don't like people. He sees our judgment of other types of people who we consider lower than us. 
He sees it all. He knows it all. Time is going to run out for each one of us. And the greatest warning is don't be caught off guard and unprepared because there will not be a do-over. I don't care what kind of faith you have that says you will come back or you can be bought out of wherever. There is absolutely no provision for another chance in the Bible. That's why Jesus is so fierce about warning. Get this right before it's too late. And sadly, in our peer group, there is very little warning when people die. There's very little warning. Most of them have no idea. The second they take that drug, they're going to be dead in a few seconds. These women anticipated the groom to come earlier than he did, and so it is with many people on this watch for the end. I cannot even believe how many people are watching world events with the intent of trying to figure out where are we on the timeline so that they have one more day, one more day, one more day of whatever it is that they are not willing to let go of. They're carefully scanning the horizon to try to figure it out. Well, you're not going to figure it out. But that's in God's mind. Uh, that is outrageous. He knows that you're trying to predict and control the last moment that you can come to him so that you can live in heaven, but not really have to know him very long because you don't really want to. When you think about that, if that's how your spouse viewed you, I only come home at one minute to midnight because I, you tell me I have to be home this same day. So I come home at one minute to midnight. I hope you're in bed because I don't have any plans to talk to you. I don't want to see you. It's that type of mentality. Only God knows. And he's the one that will make the, the evaluation of your life and motives at the end. Our idea is a perfect timing is very different from God's perfect timing. His timing is truly perfect and he's waiting that no one should perish of the group that has not heard. So if anybody is watching world events in the last two years, they are falling into place faster than anybody can even write them. And I personally am so grateful that I am saved and not doubting that because I'd be terrified if I wasn't every single day in God's timing we're often called to wait but that waiting can lull you into a false sense of thinking you've got a lifetime or you've got this year don't be fooled that you can wait and still be prepared when it matters because you don't know when that's going to happen and you also don't determine whether or not you get saved God grant salvation and we were just talking about some of the rock stars and um the different people who have been very openly opposed to god in their life what their deaths were like and in the end oftentimes there was horror they could see what was coming they would confess i have been wrong and it was too late there was nothing that could be done to save them at that point because they were slipping into death at that point and they knew where they were going. They didn't even believe in hell, but it doesn't matter if we believe in it or not. It's there. We're going to be exposed in the end the way that we are before we get there. And God determines where that line ends and where his wrath begins because of rejection after rejection after rejection when he's come to you come to you come to you come to you presenting his son's death as your sacrifice and you just keep saying i'm not ready i'm not ready i'm not ready i i'm not ready to give up this behavior that i love so much it's I, i'm just not ready one day he will decide no more chances those who truly love him desire and nurture a relationship with Jesus and they learn his will for their lives. So that's why I tell people you can't really do well 
as a believer if you don't have a community because you're left to your own head. And so if you have a community of people, you can at least glean from the community other thoughts besides your own, which you really want to believe your own or not, but you need to hear from other people. So following Jesus is done so much better if you have a community that is also desiring to follow Jesus. You have, we're expected to love one another, and this is a, a great group to be able to practice that on because it's not so loving outside of it. One choice to make every choice for Jesus is how you walk this out. So you don't make most choices for Jesus, but we're just talking about music, but yet I love this complete head banging, crazy rock stuff that that I'm it just I know it's full of swear words and all that, but I, I really gel with that. We don't get to pick or choose what flavor of thing we're going to keep when we are following Jesus with him and deservedly so, the one who died, it's all or nothing. And we want the same thing in our relationships. We do not want a clause for betrayal occasionally, sometimes. We need to lead our life as if today is the end, but be prepared to wait. But today, live like it's the last day. And there are people who deny there is a final judgment. They deny that there's a hell. I hear from people who claim to be Christian that hell is here, that there's some form of hell in your life here, a bad season. Uh, they say that's hell. But the nature of hell is clearly spelled out in the Bible, and there's nothing anybody can do to change that because God is the one who knows what hell is, and he's clear what hell is. It's a burning lake of fire that will never go out. But God, he's clear, and a number of times he's clear that hell is not on this earth. It's very likely inside the earth, but it's not something we're experiencing before death here. I don't care how bad your life is, it's certainly not even remotely close to as bad as hell is. But in order to know the truth, you have to read the Bible. And if you don't read the Bible, you're also showing you're not in the kingdom because if you are, you are committed to what God has asked us to do. And to hear him speak, we need to be in the word. So if you're not doing that, you don't know what it's saying. You're uh, making a very loud proclamation that you are not a Christian. I don't care how you get there in your thinking, but if you are not reading the Bible and you are not learning from God from that, there is no chance that you are. Because once you come to him, you are definitely in your Bible because you're trying to hear him. It's living, it's active, it's relational. That's a huge part of it. Matthew 25, 46 says, Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. There's a lot of evil in the world lurking around us, getting worse by the day. It, it, it tempts us away from God. Not necessarily the evil tempts us away from God. For us, it's the distractions. So I am dumbfounded at what social media has done to people's lives since what I, I was so old that I was there way before that. And I look at just addiction and mental health and as much as I know social media can be used for good, it has destroyed far more people than it has ever helped. And I have heard from several people that those who even develop these apps don't even want their own children on them. They know what's gonna happen. But all of this, um, these distractions are what lead us to worldly ways of thinking, pleasures, actions. It's not the evil, but it's the distractions that lead us away from God. And we end up in the same place as those who are evil because we all reject Christ. It isn't how bad you are, it's how close to Jesus are you? It is, it's not about what took you away from him. It could be your service in the church. We often dislike the term, the fear of the Lord, but to have a healthy reverence for the power and authority of God is what will cause you to resist evil and to stay vigilant in your Christian walk while you wait for his return. 
something that most of us know is coming very soon. The foolish bridesmaids who were counted as Christians, it was, they were counted in the family of God, were not vigilant, but they paid the ultimate price for that. They were shut out at the end. The judgment of God makes us uneasy and fearful. People don't like to hear that we're going to be judged. But if you were innocent and you knew your judge as intimately as he lets us know him, there is nothing about that that is going to be fearful. God did not create any of us with the option or the forethought of sending us into a lake of eternal fire that he actually prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not made for humans. And his intention was for every one of us who he gave life to, to live with him in his heavenly city forever and ever. But in his great love for us, he lets us choose to stay with him or leave him. And if you really love someone, your spouse, you don't tie them up and hold them hostage in the house because you're scared they're going to leave you or cheat on you. You give them the freedom to make choices for their own life. And that's what God has done. He's given us love and respect to choose where we will spend forever. And that's what free will is. It's a loving choice that he has given us. And we can choose to live our lives any way we want. But if we choose to turn our backs on God, he'll let us. It will be heartbreaking to him, but he will let us. He will respect our choice. He gives us so many opportunities to come to him. His greatest desire is our salvation and to be forever with him, but he will not force us. And we wonder why the five virgins who brought extra oil didn't share it with the ones who didn't. But in this case and context and the moral of this story, is about being prepared spiritually for what's coming and with the oil representing god's grace they couldn't give that away we cannot give grace or spiritual readiness to another person each person's relationship with god must be established in their own heart and soul by their own choices to seek god pursue him rid themselves of all darkness they have to do it for themselves. You cannot be a Christian because of your family heritage, because everybody's a pastor in your whole family. It doesn't work that way. Every person will choose for themselves. The 10 virgins represent the people who have faith in Jesus Christ. They know the gospel. They know the commandments. They know how they should live. And they are not considered of the world. All of them had been invited to the wedding supper and they knew the importance of the occasion. They were not pagans, they were not corrupt, they were not lost, rather they were informed people of the gospel of Jesus Christ. They knew the way, but they were unprepared for the coming of the bridegroom by neglect. And in this case, the bridegroom would be the return of Jesus in what it's illustrating. Even the foolish ones were very careful to trim their lamps at his coming, but all their oil was used up. And in the most needed moment, there was nothing to refill their lamps. And this applies to each of us because today there are thousands in the same position who are considering themselves ready. For a variety of reasons, they've stopped preparing. They are not watching for Jesus to return. They are so distracted by this life and whatever else, politics, things like that, they are so distracted. They, they are not even paying attention to the fact that possibly most of the people that they spend their time around during the day are going to burn in a lake of fire because they have no understanding of their position in Christ and what it needs to be. The church doesn't even care about most of the people that are lost around them. They have relationships, careers, some have addictions they will not part with. I was just reading again new statistics of porn in the church. It's staggering how much people think God is going to overlook that he promises he will not. Porn addiction is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality, unrepented of, will not go to heaven. So you need to get victory over that because you cannot expect to be led into heaven if you don't. Others who have lulled themselves into complacency because they think, wow, they've been talking about this since I was a kid. My grandparents thought Jesus was coming in their lifetime. So they have 
just gotten so sick and complacent of hearing it that they think it ain't gonna happen in my lifetime. The people talked like this when Jesus was alive. And most think it won't be for several hundred years. It's not gonna happen around me. I hear this from Christians a lot. I don't have any kind of date stamped on that, but I'm living ready because it's never been more apparent to me that it could be now. The responsibility for having oil is our personal in our personal lamps is a personal requirement of everyone and it cannot be shared or taken from someone else. So the wise were not being unkind or selfish when they refused oil to the foolish in that moment because the kind of oil needed by all of us to light up the darkness and illuminate the path for others is not shareable. The oil could have been purchased at the market in the parable, but in our life it is gathered at the feet of Jesus Christ, one drop at a time. You cannot share blessings that come to you from visiting those in jails, nursing homes, helping widows and the fatherless. You can't share that joy. It's not transferable. You can't share someone else's testimony of the impact of the gospel on their life effectively. If you, you don't have one, so you share someone else's. We can share other people's stories, but it's far more powerful when we have our own. One cannot share a lesson of obedience to the commandments of God if they don't even know them or follow them. And midnight is so far away, but yet it's so close. For those who are procrastinating, it's going to suddenly happen. There will be a shout and it will be over. And now is the time to add oil to the lamps, drop by drop through fasting, prayer, attending church, being part of the body of Christ. Control your self-gratification appetite. So that is so many different things. Whatever it is that you need to make your life, there is just so much variety in that. But if that, any of that, even if it's a good thing, your children in sports, whatever, is taking more time than you serving the kingdom, it will show up for that in the end as the idol that you served. We should be working on purity and thought and action, keeping marriage vows. You don't unmarry someone because you suddenly aren't the same people as when you got married. The reasons people are giving up on marriage, Christians, is insane. You, you would think they don't even read their Bible because it's not in there. They don't have that option. We are to love each other and be obedient to all the commandments to the best of our ability. Therefore, you need to know them and you need to know what they mean. And this is a very urgent matter to consider at this time because we are now living in what I truly believe are the last days before the second coming. And the second coming is not the same event as the rapture whatever that will turn out to be. The second coming is a different event because in the second coming, Jesus actually comes. He actually comes back to earth where in the rapture, he doesn't. He comes to the clouds from what people say, comes to the clouds, calls people up. But the second coming refers to Jesus coming back to earth. At this time, we are in a state of spiritual crisis. We're living very close to midnight if we heard and obeyed the warning and accumulated the oil of righteousness in our lamps, great blessings are coming for us shortly. But for those who are buying more time, you're almost out of time. The Bible says Jesus died on the cross and then he rose from the dead to life again. And after that, he went up to heaven to be with God. And before he went back up to heaven, he said that he was going to come back. He would come back to earth. He would get all the people who loved him and obeyed him, who served him, who surrendered their lives to him also because he surrendered his for us. He would take them back with him so they will live in heaven with him forever. And no one knows when he's going to come back. The Bible says he doesn't even know. But Jesus said, get ready, live ready. If you're focused on what the outside of your lamp looks like, but you're not taking care of the inside, that is going to be a real problem for you in the end too, because it's the inside that's going to be exposed for who you are, really, on Judgment Day, not the outside. 
In the Bible, oil represents the Holy Spirit. So the real question is, are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Romans 8, 8, 9 says, You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. If the Spirit of God does not dwell within you, then you do not belong to God. The good news is that when God saved you, the Holy Spirit was deposited in you to make a home in your heart. And this is a defining truth of a believer. Without the Holy Spirit or the oil that's referred to, you're an empty lamp. It doesn't matter how good and how shiny you brush that up. You're empty. And if you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you, he is such a powerful force that where you go, God goes. And you will not be hanging around the world and go unnoticed because they will be able to sense the power and presence of the Holy Spirit coming when you come. They will feel convicted of their wickedness. It's that kind of thing when the boss shows up at the water fountain, everyone scatters and stops talking. It's that it's greater than that. After receiving the Holy Spirit at salvation, we have to continuously be filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 says, Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. So when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, that's where you're victorious over sin. There's no provision made to be born again and be given a pass that you couldn't get victory over your sin because you have the power that raised Jesus from the dead available to you to accomplish that. So if you are still in sin and you think that you've done everything you can to get out, you have not because you have the power that raised Jesus and a whole bunch of other people at the same time from the dead to destroy your sin, your idol, whatever it is. You have got to turn from it to be ready for Jesus' return. You cannot make excuses in front of God on Judgment Day and say, I did everything I could. I just couldn't, couldn't quit. There's, there won't be. You'll, you won't even say it because you'll realize how insane it sounds to make that excuse. We should constantly yield more and more and more of our life to the Holy Spirit. And doing this allows him to greatly impact us. He cleans up all the trauma, all the stuff that just keeps tripping us up. That's what he does from the inside out. So you pray, you worship God, you get renewed, refilled, and strengthened by doing that. And this is how you are going to be the bright light in the world that Jesus has called us to be. In this story, it says the virgins got tired and fell asleep. And in the Bible, sometimes falling asleep is referring to dying. It says after they fell asleep, they were awakened by a cry that rang out. And when the cry came, those who were ready went into the banquet with the bridegroom and those who were not ready got locked out. And this is a picture of the rapture, actually. Consider that Paul in the Thessalonians says, Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. That's the hope of those of us who know our loved ones were in Christ, is that we're going to see them that day. They're coming with him. According to the word, we tell you that we, it tells you we, we who are, are still alive and who are left until the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep, meaning died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. First Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17. So for those who are not ready, at the point that Jesus takes those who are ready, the only way that you will be able to go to heaven after that, after this rapture incident, 
would be to become a martyr. You will be murdered for your faith. That is the only other way to get there is that through all the tribulation or whatever's left, that you would be given a chance to deny Christ and be murdered and you do. That's the way to, if you were missed, that's the way that you will have to go in. Jesus was helping his disciples understand what this would be like. Your eternal destination is determined by what you do now, today. Today is determining eternity, where you go, and what you do there, what position you will have there. If you do nothing for the kingdom here, you're not going to be rewarded with much there. Those who serve faithfully and do kingdom work here will be given the greater tasks there. And once you die or fall asleep, it's too late. Eternity is sealed. Those who were ready went into the banquet and the door was shut. Those who were not ready were locked out. And this should motivate everyone to share the gospel with others because the day is now. And if we really do belong to Jesus, we want as many, especially of those we know, to be at that banquet when he comes. And you cannot delay one more day because there are so many people dying anymore it's shocking whether it's from drugs there's so many more suicides just these random heart attacks young people it's crazy how many people are dying one of the most stunning statements in this entire story is verse 12 but he replied truly i tell you i do not know you and imagine that five hearing these words and the shock when they were hit with the reality and this is not the first time jesus said this I don't know you. Yeah, the Sermon on the Mount, he said it on that day. There will be many people who have done things in Jesus' name, yet his response to them will be, Depart from me, I never knew you. Matthew 7, 23. And then this is a great question in life. It is not, do you know Jesus? The question is, does Jesus know you? That's the determining question, not whether you think you know him. It is whether he says he knows you that will determine heaven or hell. Jesus knowing you has nothing to do with your deeds or actions. Some of us are brought a little bit more to the table on that than others. But Jesus knowing us has to do with us putting our trust in him as both Lord and Savior. There's no option for one or the other getting as close to him as we possibly can in this life nothing else matters if there's any day that you want to be known by jesus that's the day and it's the only day that you will be given that choice this story goes far beyond those who don't know Jesus. As I've said, many want to believe. They want to believe that these were unsaved, five of them. It just determined who was saved and who wasn't. But it does say that all of these women had lamps, all of them. So this is a real wake-up call for those who are in the church but are not following Jesus. They are walking out their life according to their own desires. That's this group. The foolish ones are that group. They claim salvation but they live their life the way that they want. It doesn't even have to be in blatant sin. They just live the way they want. And in other words, they have empty lamps. And more than ever before, if you're not walking the way that you should be on the day that you would know Jesus was coming, you already know how you should be walking. If you're not going to do that, he owes you nothing else. Many die suddenly with no opportunity to correct this because God already knows they understood that and they were waiting for something luke 9 23 jesus looks at his disciples and tells them whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves take up their cross and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will find it that doesn't mean even a life of crime it can be a choice to chase career chase something but not kingdom building in roman times the cross was a terrifying object of torture suffering and execution if you carried a cross you were on your way to be crucified on it and when jesus makes this statement he terrified the disciples 
He didn't die on the cross to end human suffering. Like most people seem to think if you know Jesus, you shouldn't suffer. Because if you look around the world, it's full of suffering, starvation, natural disasters. They spare no one and many other awful things. Jesus became human and filled pain and suffering with his eternal presence. The very same thing he has called us to do in the darkest moments of our life or even the everyday struggles and temptations, Jesus is there if that's who we partner with in this life. And just as he willingly took up his cross for us, we must take up our cross for him and share in his suffering. That's what he says. In Colossians 1.24, Paul says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for you, and I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions, for the sake of his body, which is the church, what, which means that we are each going to carry our own cross. We get to share in Christ's redemption of the world. It means that our suffering is not worthless. It's not just pain that has no value. Pain has incredible value when the world is watching you and they're trying to decide how are they doing that like that. When we trust in Christ during our struggle, our pain will be used to bring many into the kingdom if we let it and redeem the world. It has purpose. So don't waste your suffering. It's powerful. It's beautiful. It speaks louder than any kind of good thing you could ever have. When you carry your cross, think about somebody important to you that you would want to show that you can go through something terribly difficult and still walk in peace and joy you want to bring as many as you can to the kingdom before you leave this earth. God will use our crosses to not just build us, but build others as well, and certainly build heaven. And he made it clear to his disciples that he demands to be loved above every other thing in our life, all relationships, including parents and children, spouses. He said, I'm first. If he's not first, there's no other position for him. Only God could make such a demand. He created us. He has every right to demand that. We demand first with our spouses. He has every right to demand first. To love God is the greatest commandment. And those who refuse to choose Jesus first make themselves unworthy of being his disciples. That's what he says. They disobey God's first command to love him with everything that they have. And Jesus said to those who would follow him that they must be also willing to participate in putting themselves to death. His meaning in context with his other teachings is that a believer must die to their own personal desires. They must be willing to let go of all their own agendas, their personal dreams, their ways of living, their, their favorite different things. Might not even be sinful, but you don't get to hang on to those things. Self has to die. They must be willing to submit to walking the difficult path of Christ all the way to the end of their lives. Nobody can call himself or herself a follower of Jesus and at the same time follow their own path, do things their own way, and ignore the righteous life God has called them to. We are missionaries. We are not of this world. If you are of this world and you are not a missionary for Christ, the Bible gives you no hope of heaven. Those who will not die to themselves and live for Jesus are not worthy of heaven, he says. Notice that this issue of worthiness to live as a disciple of Jesus is one of self-selection. That is, all must choose to either love Jesus more than anything else and serve what he asks them to, or they can choose not to do that, not to die to themselves and live for him alone. They can choose to live their life pleasurably, comfortably. Jesus said they're unworthy of his son, of him. Jesus does not declare them unworthy for following him badly. Those who will not, who refuse, make themselves unworthy because of their lack of complete and total commitment to him. We should be rich in good works and generous in those in need, always being ready to share with others. And by doing this, we're storing up treasure as a good foundation for the future. So the only thing that we get to keep is what we send on to heaven ahead of us, whether it's finances, people, the only things 
that we will have at the end of this life is what we sent on ahead. First Timothy 6, 18 through 19 says, they should be rich in good works and generous to those in need, always being ready to share with others. By doing this, it will be storing up their treasure as a good foundation for the future so that they may experience true life. And those who do this are going to enjoy forever because they invested in heaven here and they get to participate in that there and have even far greater assignments and an experience. This earth is a shadow, a dim shadow of what's to come. Precious Lord, there are so many around us that are not in any way feeling urgent about the times that we're living in and you are screaming through so many different ways that you are coming back soon. I ask you again for revival. We want to see for revival. We want to see your kingdom come to this earth and whatever it takes for that to happen, we ask that you bring revival. It may cost people some great perks and benefits to be alive here, but what would it matter if they kept all those things and then lost eternity because they never looked at you, Jesus? So we ask you to work powerfully in every life that hears this and bring them to a very solid and now commitment to live only for Jesus Christ. Thank you for every single blessing you have overwhelmed us with blessing here. We are so grateful to be ambassadors for the King. I ask that you help us to continue to walk worthy of the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen.